Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person, Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum 23 years ago. Each month, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. During our conversation, please send us your questions and let us know where you are watching from in the live chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Agi Giva share her firsthand account of the Holocaust with us, including her experiences at Auschwitz. It's particularly special to have Agi here as we approach Interna International Holocaust Remembrance Day next week, which was established on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, where approximately 1.1 million people were murdered. Augie, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. We are just delighted to have you with us. Augie, you have so much to share with us today. We have just one hour, so we're going to get started. You were born in Budapest, Hungary in June 1930. Before we turn to World War II and the Holocaust, please tell us about your family and your early life in Hungary. Well, here is my sister, Sosha, and myself at the age of, I think, four, five, or five, six maximum. And my family was, but actually my father, Zoltan Laszlo, my mother, Rosalia Laszlo, and uh, we were on a farm that my father was, uh, the director of, and this picture is still on the farm in the garden where we loved to spend time. Augie, one of the things that you shared with me was that you loved life on the farm and that you had lots and lots of cousins because you had a large extended family. I did, and all the, um, the usually in summers, the family came and spent time with us. Uh, and still I can't recall my grandparents. I don't remember any of my grandmothers. I remember one of my grandfathers, but the cousins and the aunts were there every summer. Eventually, though, you left the farm. Tell us why your family moved to the countryside town of Mishkoltz, Hungary. Uh, my father somehow, Zoltan, was uh, fired in 1936, and that was too early actually to to be fired because if you are Jewish, the anti-Semitism wasn't that much felt yet, and the, all the directors actually of these farms that belonged to the aristocrats, they were all fired. My father took it very hard. He got a heart attack, actually never uh, recovered from it. Yes. So my mother had to take over the responsibility of looking after the family. Her name is Rosalia Walls. And she sought to have a small hotel who will uh, take care of everything as it's did. And here we see, of course, a portrait, a lovely, lovely portrait of your mother. And, and the one just before that was of your father. Your, your father, Augie, saw the importance of languages. Which languages did you speak as a child and how did you learn them? My father had this notion to think, to have something that won't be that can't be taken away from us, actually. So it 
told my sister the same. And he brought Fräuleins that today we call them au pairs from Germany to talk to us, to look after us, and uh, they didn't know any Hungarian. So we very quickly learned the language of German. So when I came first grade there, I knew actually both languages the same. It was a second mm -hmm. month. So you spoke, and then you later you would even learn additional languages, and 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 it all goes back to your father stressing the importance of knowing languages. Augie, before we continue, I'd like to let you know that we have people who've tuned in today to listen and see you uh, from not only around the country but around the world. As a matter of fact, we have viewers watching in Michigan, Nevada, Idaho, and New York, as well as students from Claude High School. And we have viewers from places elsewhere like Iceland, the Philippines, Malta, and New Zealand. We also have a comment from a viewer named Christian. Christian says, thank you for sharing your story, Augie. It is our responsibility to never allow this to happen again. World War II began in September 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. Hungary, formerly allied with Nazi Germany in 1940, and then joined in the German war effort. However, you did not feel the full effects of war until much later. Please tell us what you can about day-to-day -day life in Hungary for you and your family during the wartime. Actually, it was very little change in our usual daily life. Just the knowledge what was happening and my parents kept on telling us don't worry it's us it will never happen to us it will never happen we will never be actually in this position and and was that we were because in 1944 the 19th of december of march it was the most tragic and then the very very bad day for our worst i could say day for me because that morning my father died and it took a couple of hours until we realized that also the germans occupied hungary Augie, before if you don't mind before you continue to talk about life once the germans occupied hungary maybe i can just go back and ask you a couple more questions we just saw some photographs that were taken before the German occupation, but while the war was going on. Just tell us a little bit about these next two pictures, this one and the next one. This was actually the last picture where the family was still together in 1943 or 44 uh, winter. It's my mother, father, and I think it was our English teacher. And Shosha, my sister and myself, standing at the entrance to the hotel. And uh, this picture is only of Shosha and myself building a snowman this winter when we were still able to be free, if I would express it the right way. No, that's the right way, I think, Gagi. At, at that time, were you able to attend school during that time, and did you experience any anti-Semitism at that time? You know, we attended school till the last day even, I could say, and anti-Semitism was very uh, little felt, but still in the school, in the classroom, as there were only two Jewish girls, uh, my friend Edith and myself, we felt only not, uh, we didn't feel them telling us by words that, oh, you are Jewish and that's why, so and so. But they didn't invite us to their houses. They didn't uh, hang out with us in the intermissions. They uh, were polite actually, but uh, it wasn't really mentioned, the difference between our religions. But one day when I went home from school, 
I saw a boy from far picking up stones and starting to throw it at me and yelling, the dirty Jew, dirty Jew. Uh, it was uh, really scary, shocking. I had my hand back, back on my back, so the stones fell actually on that one. It didn't hurt me physically but mentally very much mm -hmm. but even though i decided not to not to talk about it at home not to tell my parents what happened they would have taken it very seriously they might have not let me out of the house or something like this but that was already the last days before the occupation and and of course once the occupation uh, took place things changed profoundly and you began to tell us about that day march 19th 1944 and as you said also the day that your dad died on that day tell us tell us what you remember augie about that day the day became very very different and it stayed that way it stayed different uh, in many ways we had new rules we couldn't leave the house without a yellow star on our jacket or blouse, whatever we were wearing. Uh, Jewish teenagers were not supposed to have bicycles. We had to hand them into the municipality. We were not supposed to have dogs. We were not supposed uh, to live in our house any longer. I think it took a week or two before we were sent or taken or forced, I don't even know which word is, is, is uh, used in this case, taken to the ghetto. That was the worst of the worst situation that I thought that time. Of course, of course, it came much, much worse later. But that time I thought that was bad enough. Augie, when, when you were forced to wear the yellow star, which was one of many uh, of the new policies, the anti-Semitic policies that were imposed by the authorities. What did it feel like for you to wear that yellow star? It felt, first of all, it felt humiliating, very humiliating. Uh, people knew who I was and it was a small town. They knew I was Jewish and so on. But just to have it spelled out, that way it was uh, not the best feeling. And mostly that it was restricted. I couldn't be without it. It was under no conditions I could have left the house without it. And Augie, as you, as you mentioned, you were then forced to move into a ghetto. What conditions uh, did you face or encounter once you were into the ghetto? And how long were you there? You know, now after knowing what else came after it, I can still describe it, but it doesn't have the same effect as, as it had that time when I thought that this was really the worst situation. It was a fenced off part of the city. And most uh, apartments were small, built for one family. And uh, we came to join them by we, I mean two, three, maybe four, maybe five even, families owned into this small apartment. So privacy was something non-existent anymore. I don't remember even where we slept. I don't remember where we ate. I know only that we had no possibility to talk to each other without being overheard by another 10 people or so. We found it, by we I mean my mother and sister, as our father wasn't with us anymore at this time. We really suffered, we really had a very, very bad time. And, and as you said, you thought that was the worst that could happen, and of course that, that was not. In mid-May 1944, the German and Hungarian authorities began to systematically deport the Jews from the countryside. The Jews of Mischkoltz, where you lived, were sent to a brick factory for deportation in June. What do you remember about the brick factory that you were forced to go to? 
I hardly remember at all uh, what we did there, actually. I don't remember whether we ate, whether we slept, whether how long. All these were very vague. What was very vivid yet were the trains, the cattle wagons that kept on coming and going into the station. And all the time I thought, OK, when they leave, then our train will come with what we are going to travel. And of course, it wasn't true. The effect was that we were uh, traveling in the, these uh, cattle wagons. And my mother was told by friends, actually, that the guards are not uh, so many. She could just take us out from the factory that had no walls. It had only a ceiling. Uh, she didn't even think of it seriously. She was so decided about being together and having us near her all the time and to take such a risk. She, she didn't even consider it. But we kept on seeing these cattle wagons until the order came that we have to travel in them, we have to enter them, we have to mount them, we have uh, many standing places that were used up to the limit. And, and we, we're looking at a photograph of the very exact kind of train that you were forced to get on the cattle cars. Yes. To, tell, us, tell us some, um, tell us the conditions that you encountered in those trains once you were forced into them and set off on your journey. It was a situation that I've never ever imagined that human beings can force on other human beings actually, or even human beings can travel that way. The small window under the roof was the only, only way to get some air or light into this uh, wagon. Uh, when it started to move, of course, it started to shake us down to a sitting position that was not a position. It wasn't sitting exactly. It was, it, it was worse, worse, worse than anything I could have ever imagined. And of course, you you, you had um, uh, no food or water, or, or very little water with you on and like in the trains. Even if we had, I can't remember how much or what we had. It was impossible in this situation to to drink or eat. It, it was impossible. It was so. possible. And and of course, after I, I believe you said it took three days and. So after three days, the train stopped, the doors opened, and you were in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Tell us what you saw when those doors opened. Well, I saw also the camp far away. That seemed scary. And, uh, and I heard the word death camp for Auschwitz. I had absolutely no idea what it meant. I didn't even want to know. But then I saw these two groups of people that I have no idea how in such a quick way the Germans could separate us, the men and the women. And the men were already on their way out of the station when the women started to realize that these were their brothers, husbands, sons, begged the guards to tell goodbye, to tell a word, to, to just connect that, of course, it was not uh, allowed even to get near so there were enough crying and and, and uh, screamings going around and, and here we see of course the men all gathered in one line and the women um, on the left all in their own line yeah and then we then my mother started to regret more and more that she didn't try even to escape and we were still in Mishkols. Right. That she let us get into this situation. That's how she thought, actually. And once you were 
separated from the uh, the men were separated from the women you're in the women's line almost immediately your family faced a selection nazi officers decided who was fit for labor and who would be sent to their deaths although your mother did not know what you were being selected for she was adamant that the three of you do all you could to stay together tell us what your mother did She decided to take a big, big risk. We were already actually on gunpoint all the time, anyhow. And we were going slowly, slowly to the selection station, if I would say it that way. And that was a word I've never, ever heard in my life. A possibility that two, three German I would say that they were officers, but it's hard for me even to, to after that word to look us over and decide left or right. At that time, we didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. Later, when we knew it was even worse. But my mother was, this, let's see, very much only to be sure that we are going to stay together. She didn't care whether it will be on the left or on the right, on what, what it meant. All she wanted us to have, to stay together. So all what she was watching was who was sent left and who was sent right. And she decided that right will be the right place for all of us be able to stay together after she heard actually that it was announced that every girl under 16 goes to the left, that she was even more sure of herself what it meant for us. And then when she heard that people were begging the selecting officers, just let me stay with my mother, please, with my daughter, with my sister. And it was an automatic separation immediately. So these were the main points that she told us when she came, got back to us, of course, on gunpoint again, was lucky that she could tell it to us. And she warned us not to call her mother or sister or, or not to be 16, but to be at least, she said, 18 and 19, and I was supposed to be 19, but had to show somehow that I looked older also. So she just told it take out our scarves that we had with us and bind it in a way that it should make us older. And it was that way. And it really worked somehow because we were believed that we are 19 and my sister 18 and we, we could stay with the group of the people who were sent to the right. My mother bound her head this way that she thought that it will it will uh, make her look younger. She was uh, she wanted to look younger ten years at least, mm -hmm. and she succeeded somehow. And she was selected with us together. You know, I, I just, I, I know everybody watching is marveling over your mother's um, wisdom, insights, intuition, whatever it was that said first, do not rec call each other as family members. Um, and then secondly, she knew to make you look older and to make herself younger in order to stay together and, and, and move to the right side. After the three of you were selected together, you were then essentially processed at Auschwitz. Can you tell us what you remember happening uh, then? What was happening was one humiliating thing after the other, one worse than the other. The worst was to have to undress and be shaved from all hair on our body. That was unimaginable to happen ever actually, that we had to leave our trolleys behind. For me, it was okay. 
but I had in for the book, I was reading recently maybe a piece of chocolate, maybe um, I think it was a new dress also, but for the grown-ups it was really, really tragic. They, they, they had passports, money, jewel, everything that would be necessary to stay alive or to bribe was taken away and they were so begging and crying and, and, and promising everything only to keep their luggage that was impossible. Mm -hmm. um, all but that happened was the showers that we had real water in the other barracks it was gas that we I couldn't understand what it meant even. And that was the point when my mother understood that I better don't know anything that was happening and asked all her friends and the neighbors, whoever were with her, around her, that to keep me of the information of the reality. Augie, and, um, um, I'd like to remind our audience that uh, to please share any questions that they have for you via the chat feature. So please send your questions. And we do have a question from two viewers named Manuel and Emma. And they asked, where did your inner strength and inspiration come from during those hard times at the camps? I'm sure it came from my mother, actually, that she went out of her way to to keep us together, and that meant somehow to keep us alive. And I couldn't disappoint her, and I never showed sadness or or, or despair or negative thoughts for my sister also. I felt very responsible as a big sister, even though we had one year mm -hmm. between us. I think that was the, the main reason family 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 there's a there's a very fitting comment that's just come in uh, from a viewer named rachel rachel states amazing how mom was able to think so quickly in a terrible situation the love of a mother and instinct yeah and wisdom mm -hmm. no Aug and mm -hmm. Augie, several weeks after you arrived in Auschwitz, you, your mother, and your sister were transferred to the Plashoff concentration camp, which is the camp depicted in the film Schindler's List. What conditions did you face once you were in Plashoff? We were sure we are going to have some better conditions, like in Auschwitz, let's say a little better food, a little better sleeping conditions. But when we found out that the inmates were criminals um, out of the prisons that were opened, we, they scared us more than, than the Germans itself. So we were frightened day and night, all the time looking over our shoulders. And then the work was very hard. And if I see this picture, it really reminds me of Egypt in every way, I could say so. And, and the world was senseless. It was uh, to carry up big rocks that we can see here in the carts. We had to carry, take out the rocks and take them up a hill. And we thought, okay, but no, we had to carry them back next day. The same rocks, in the same way, to the same place. It was really more than humiliating. It was, it was, it had no purpose at all. Agi, just to kind of repeat a couple of things you said. One, along with um, uh, all the Jews that were forced to be in Plashoff as prisoners there, um, there were others that were just common criminals, murderers, uh, robbers, as you said, uh, that were also part of the prison population, all mixed together 
and that was very scary for you. And then, um, as you said about this picture is powerful. It's a group of women um, being forced to pull up a grade, carts filled with rocks. And as you said, you got to the end um, and then unloaded them and the next day put them back and had to pull them back down at, for no purpose other than just to humiliate and force you to do very hard labor. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, um, Augie, as the Soviet army approached the camp in the summer of 1944, the Germans prepared to dismantle Plashoff. The SS transferred prisoners to other concentration camps. What did you think was happening and where were you and your family sent from Plashoff? Well, we didn't know where we are going to be sent, but I had a very bad feeling and I was really desperate, even though my mother kept on telling that we were in the worst camps already. There can't be anything worse than Auschwitz and Plasho, and the third one will be surely something better in every way. And this time, really, she couldn't convince me. And when we opened the door and we looked out where we were, and I saw that we were back in Auschwitz, I realized that was really the worst that could have happened. And, and so you're sent right back to Auschwitz. And once you were there, you faced another selection. Please tell us about the moment you faced the Nazi officer. The moment I faced him and he sent me to the left after sending my mother and sister to the right, I was just uh, in, in, a, in a very, very strange situation to be able to, not to be able to, to follow my mom and sister and she and he uh, just was waiting, why don't I move, why don't I go to the left? And I told him, no, no, please, I would like to go to that side. And he asked, but who is on that side? What is on that side? Hoping that I will say my mother and sister. But after my mother told us at the first selection never to mention the, the relationship, never to mention sister, family, mother. I didn't say, I said, yeah, that's a working camp. Then he said, you don't look to me able to work still. And then suddenly he stopped and realized that we were talking German. And he told, this is a Hungarian transport, how come you know German that well? Ah, okay, go where you wanted. And he sent me to the right. And, and of course, um, you go, that goes back to your father insisting that you learn language as well. And, and German saved you uh, at that point. Really saved my life at that point. Yeah. It really did. Augie, uh, during the Holocaust, concentration camps, prisoners received tattoos of their prisoner number at only one location, and that was Auschwitz. After this second selection, you received a tattoo. Please tell us how that impacted you and about this photograph. The photograph was after a presentation or in the middle of a presentation showing the tattoo itself that my mother kept telling us, my sister and myself, Please never ever think even of, of removing it in any way, because the stories we are telling, everybody can tell, but a proof, a living proof of a tattoo like this, where the first letter A means Auschwitz and the number of, means the number of people who came that day and were tattooed. So we really kept it and and uh, I have it till today, and so did my mother and sister. And, uh, you know, it's very, very humiliating to 
have this number on us. But I kept my word and I really never thought even of removing it. I've, I've been present um, when you have shown that to an audience as you did in this picture. Yes. It is so powerful for our audience and for you uh, to be able to do that. Augie, I'd like to share an audience comment and a question from Amelia. Amelia writes, I hope you're doing well, Augie. I have a question. Do you think you've always had this bravery inside you or did it develop during your time there? Thank you. As I was very, very young when I got there, that's the expression, got to the concentration camp, I got to be uh, deported. I think I didn't have it or it wasn't proved. I, I think it developed in the concentration camp. It was a necessary, very necessary daily fact that we needed to be brave, we needed to be strong, we needed to be different mm -hmm. than ever before. If this answers your question, I think I think uh, that gives her uh, gives Amelia a really good response and answer to her question. There is a woman from your hometown. Um, also with you at Auschwitz, who happened to be an opera singer. Um, what do you remember about her? Oh, well, I remember her name was Lily. And she was, in the beginning, she was also with her mother and sister. But her mother was selected the first or the second time. And she was very sad and very miserable. And, and then someone remembered that she was learning to sing arias in the operas and then they started to ask her to sing us in the beginning she didn't even think of it and didn't even uh, wanted to to sing but when she did and when she decided it made not only us feel so very good but it made her feel better so she did it almost weekly, on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and sang us all the beautiful arias of the operas we knew. In, in the midst of all the horror around yeah. you, that must have been just a, a remarkable little short respite for each of you. It was for all of us, yes, it was. We could yeah. close our eyes and just imagine we are in an opera house, we really hear a real opera, a real aria, he could do it. And it helped. It really helped. In, Augie, in, in the fall of 1944, camp authorities selected you, your mother, and your sister for work in a small labor camp in Rocklitz, a subcamp of the Flossenburg concentration camp in Germany. In 1944, the production of aircraft Parts determined many labor assignments in the Flossenburg system. Please tell us about the type of work you were trained to do while you were at Rocklitz. At Rocklitz, we were told to have a piece of aluminum given to us with a plan how to make it work, how to make a, a screw, a spare part of a real aeroplane out of it. And uh, my machine was called the revolver drebang. And when I got this plan and a pencil and I could sit on a chair, it really made me feel very good. It made me feel even better seeing this pencil and using it than a piece of bread, and that was a big deal those days. It made me feel again responsible and human after all what we went through in Auschwitz. And I've learned how to how to make this machine, how to make it make the screws out of this aluminium piece with some practice 
And when we were ready, all of us, that were 180 Hungarians, 20 Polish people, uh, we were sent to the real factory in Kalf, near Stuttgart. So the, the, once your training was completed, that's when you went to Kalf to actually yes. make yes. the make yes. Mark news. Yes. So once you got to Kalf, which was a sub camp of the Natsveller Struthof uh, concentration camp, once you were there, then what were the conditions like for you now that you were to start making these screws? The conditions were very surprising. I really couldn't have imagined that they will be that much different from Rochlitz, where we were training only actually, but that the real work should be 12 hours at night was a real surprise and a challenge. To start at seven in the evening, till seven in the morning to stand near these machines and it has to be standing. And then to try to rest the daytime that was impossible, I had a very hard time. And then, of course, I thought that this will be the worst. This is the worst, not the ghetto and not what came after it and not being in Auschwitz. That was the worst, but of course it wasn't. That's so your, your job was to, to make these screws from seven in the evening till seven the next morning, 12 hours standing on your feet and then not able to get rest during the day than once you were um, out, out, you were off the job, so to speak. While, while you were there at Calv, um, your mother began to perform acts of sabotage. Will you tell us about that? Well, she was working at the machine uh, to file down the screws that were oversized. And she had the plan, of course, got the plan, how much to do it, how to do it. And she one day experienced that the stone, filing stone exploded and it scared her and she fainted. And they took her to the headquarters, explaining that this is a very delicate stone and it's very hard to find a new one and it's hard to install it again and until then the not ready screws had to wait in a crate near the doors to be controlled first so she thought of it that maybe maybe this might be a good thing to to uh, install the war actually and she kept on doing it this time, not by chance, but but really, it's something that I really couldn't imagine and wouldn't even know, and had not known till the till after the war. But she kept on doing it, and the crates kept on growing near the door, and she was very happy about it that she could do something. Actually. And she called it mini sabotage. Mini sabotage. The the yeah. thinking about the how much courage and resolve that took for her to deliberately press too hard to cause that grinding stone to, to shatter. I mean the risk for her had to be extraordinary. It was. It was that I don't think that even she realized what the big risk she took. Here. You know, just just re just remarkable after working in cal for several months you and the other workers there there were as you said 180 hungarian women and 20 polish women uh, 200 of you you were then sent on foot on what what is known as a death march in extremely harsh conditions tell us about that death march and and what you thought was going to happen this time, I really can say that this was the worst. It was really the worst. We had no suitable clothes. We had no underwear. We had no socks. We had no scarves. We had no head, gloves, had such stuff. We couldn't even dream of. We just had one dress 
and one pair of shoes that did not fit all the time. Uh, we were very, very cold, very tired, very exhausted. Had to walk all the night, never on the roads, always in the forests. Because they, the German guards, we had six of them. One woman officer, uh, man officer, four soldiers. They uh, were not allowed. They surely had their orders not to keep us on the main roads where it would be more comfortable to walk, actually. The rain would be easier, the wind would be less. But no, we had to walk through the forests and we had to, they had to look for a barn for us in the mornings to sleep in. And then they saw that there is no possibility to find food. They told us, find your own food in the barns. It was usually a row, carrot, a row, cabbage and row potatoes. Uh, sometimes the villagers tried to give us something that, of course, the German took away before it got to us. It was impossible to rest or sleep in these barns. We had a very hard, hard time. <laughs> very, very, very hard time. In, in fact, um, you were forced on that march during what was one of the most um, harshest winters in, in many, many, many years, winter of 1944, 1945. And as you said, you were just you know, barely clothed and no shoes in some cases. How, that must have been extraordinarily difficult. I can't even, I can't even tell you how difficult. I can't even imagine it now how we could be, how we could have been able to, to survive. Mm -hmm. As you were marching, as you said, you were forced to walk through the woods, not on the main roads. Um, when did you when did you know that you were free? When did you realize that? We suddenly didn't see any guards around us. It was sudden and uh, surprising because we all we could see them from everywhere and we could see them everywhere, whether it was night, whether it was day and one of us told that look around there are no guards i can't see the guards and as we did look around we really didn't see them and then one of the polish kapos they were called lagerettes they were a couple among the 20 polish people that were with us uh, told us in german that from today, the 28th of April, 1945, you are free. You know, that was my worst day until that moment that became really the best day ever. I could never, I really, I, I already thought that I will stay a prisoner of war or whatever I was called forever that I will not be able to live a normal life again, ever. I, I was sure. And that came as a, as a, <laughs> as a surprise and, and as a very, very happy moment. Mm -hmm. And it became really the best day of best. my whole life. And, and Augie, as you said, that was April 28th, 1945 when you and, and all, all the others in your group of 200, I think, or most of them, um, were liberated by U.S. troops on that date. And you were not quite even 15 years old. So what, what, what did you do next? What did, what did liberation really mean once you realized that you were, the guards were gone and U.S. troops were there? And what, what, did that, what was that like? I wouldn't have known really what to do at this moment. Besides just, I, I don't even know how to express it, just, just being happy, just just being surprised. And my whole life changed, my plans changed. I mean, I had, I could have plans again, I could live again, I could breathe again. 
but my mother was again the most realistic because among the 180 Hungarians, there were 180 opinions where we were, what to do, what should happen. So she didn't even want to participate with anyone. She told, that's what I want to do. That's what I think is correct. Whoever joins me will go. She wanted to leave immediately this forest. She wanted to go, let's say, west, but I can't remember exactly what was the direction. 30 women joined her, and we started out at a certain direction, let's say, west, when we heard these English-speaking voices. That made us very happy. We didn't want to be, we didn't want to meet again Germans. And started all over again, but it was Americans. They were the first Americans I ever saw. And they were so nice to us, and they were so... Uh, they looked so important. It was so f important for them to make us feel good and make us feel free. They took us to their headquarters and saw to it that we have medical attention immediately and whatever, I, whatever we needed. I want you, of course, to tell us that they offered to uh, make some purchases for you. Tell us, tell us about that. They they told us we are going to town. We are going to shop for you. So please, everybody should tell us what you dreamt of the whole year, what you missed most. So people needed uh, either a cap or a scarf or a pair of shoes or a schnitzel, or a creme schnitt, or a piece of chocolate. So everybody came up with whatever they came up with. They went and told me, I'm going to get it for you. And when it came to me, I, all I wanted was lipstick. And they, they got it for me. They got you your lipstick. They got me lipstick. <laughs> and this time my mother couldn't say, no, 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 you can't use it. Oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Augie, we, we have another audience question to share with you. And this is from Suna, a 14-year-old from Iceland. And so Suna asks, what was it like when you came out to learn to live again as a teenager after going through this terrible experience? Suna, look, I didn't feel as a teenager anymore, ever. I think that these years were taken from me. I came out of this of these camps as as a grown up, as someone really responsible with uh, plans for life. Mm -hmm. So it didn't feel anymore as a teenager. But I wouldn't even know how it felt for other teenagers. But I had plans. I had learned a lot what yes to do, what not to do, what is correct, what is not correct. And I never till today took for granted that I'm free. Never. I, 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 you know, there isn't a single day I shouldn't think, oh my God, it shouldn't happen again. And I'm grateful as long as I'm free. You can't take it for granted anymore. No. You're absolutely right, Augie. Don't and know about that, please. Yes. Your your remarkable mother, as you said, she said, "Well, I'm going this way," and 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 other women joined her and headed with her. Eventually, your mother decided that you all should go back to Mishkaltz. Tell us what returning to Hungary was like, and was your mother able to get her hotel back? She wanted to go back to find out what happened with the rest of the family who stayed alive, who did not. But we were living in Mishkols and we arrived to Budapest, found out about the family, and then she had to decide what to do. And we got back to Mishkols and she thought she will just go into the hotel and it will, she will find whatever she left, but it wasn't, it was empty. People emptied it, stole it, changed it, 
So she went to the municipality and got some help. It was really surprising and she could go from house to house and show, this is my carpet, this were my bed, these are my curtains, these are my tables. And they helped the, my mother to refurnish the hotel and she could reopen it and start it business as usual, the way we say today. It still stands to this day. It does, but it's not It's not a hotel and it's not the way it was. Uh, every floor is, has a different uh, apartment with different uh, people living there. But that, that's how it was when I was there the last time because it was important that we should go back and and look at show it to our children where we came from and where we grew up. Mm -hmm. So then I saw that it was uh, not as we left it, actually. We, we have another um, question for you from Katie. And Katie asks, what is your advice for early actions as a parent to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, to make sure that it doesn't happen again, I don't think we can take such a guarantee, but we can take some precautions so we can... First of all, we should learn languages. That will, that's not possible that somebody should be out of a job if knows one language well. It will be either translations or, or uh, uh, interpretations. It will be a job. Mm -hmm. And never to stay indifferent when you see that someone is hurt by by injustice to take sides immediately and help out if, if that's what you do of course it can't happen easily again what happened and on and on there and yeah yeah augie eventually life in hungary became unbearable for you and and in 1949, you and your sister moved to Israel. Your mother joined you both several years later, I think, after the Hungarian Revolution. And you have so much more to share with us. And unfortunately, we're, we're almost um, at the end of our time here. Um, next week, Agi, on January 27th, we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which marks the liberation of Auschwitz. On this day, we honor all those who were murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators and reaffirm our commitment to confront hatred and anti-Semitism in all its forms. So I, I do have one more question for you. As we face rising anti-Semitism, related conspiracy theories and Holocaust denial, tell us what we can learn, what we should learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. I actually have to repeat, not to stay indifferent. That is one of the most important acts we can do to help each other. For the younger people, I would say to find someone to look up to, to respect and follow in, in, in every way, whatever they choose or advise to do. I think that would that would be one of the most important things. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. I I am so grateful, uh, and I know all my colleagues at the museum are grateful to know you, uh, to have you in our life. And I just wish I had had the opportunity to meet your mother, who lived to be, I think, over ninety-seven years of age and your sister uh, and, and just the extraordinary trio that you were and the incredible person your mother was, who then of course created the remarkable person that you are. Um, so thank you, Augie, so much for being our first person. Thank you for, for having me. I'd like to take a moment to just um, thank our donors First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. 
Next Friday, January 27th, the museum will commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Please join us at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time for a live conversation with another survivor of Auschwitz, Irene Weiss. Irene will share her experiences live on the museum's Facebook page. And I'd also like to invite you to join our next First Person program. Please tune in on February 15th, 2023 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for a conversation with survivor, uh, Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, Rita Rubenstein. Rita and her family endured dire conditions after Romanian authorities forced them into the Shargarad ghetto. They lived in an overcrowded clay hut facing extreme hunger and a typhus epidemic. Tune in to hear about Rita's experience of survival. Thank you for being with us today.